All right, hi everybody, my name is Tori and I'm here to talk to you about uh, how we are going to format exhibits, documentaries, and performances for History Day. We're going to start with tips for exhibits today, so switch you. As always, you're going to want to look at the rubric, which is either located on the OK History website or the National History Day website. You'll see on the rubric that the majority of it uh, for historical quality, 80%, kind of remains the same through all five categories. What's really important to look at is the bottom part, clarity of presentation, 20%. That's where you're going to see some of the main details that differ in between each category. For instance, with our exhibits, there are things that say presenting written material appropriately, presenting visual material clearly. These are kind of things that you can use to lead your checklist when you are uh, getting ready for your presentation. All right, so constructing an exhibit outline, much like some of the other pieces that we have here, uh, you're always going to want to start with making an outline and a thesis statement that relates to the theme. Make sure you do your research and remember that historical quality is the key thing. If you don't have historical quality, a good argument, a solid thesis, then it doesn't matter how pretty your exhibit is, that's kind of what we're going to focus on. Uh, then you will storyboard and outline your physical exhibit. Here's a uh, pretty good example of how general exhibit structure usually goes. And this is sort of based on the uh, three-sided poster board that's common. So the far side is one side of the poster board, then the middle, and then the other side. So we're gonna start with the uh, far side with background info and topic specific info. This is where you're going to put things for kind of an overview of your topic and then really zero in on information about your specific topic. For instance, if you're talking about a specific battle during the Civil War, at the top in background info, you would put things like specific dates for the Civil War as a whole, uh, specific politicians or generals that were involved, uh, specific moves that sort of changed over time, maybe a timeline. But at the bottom in topic specific info, this is where you would start talking more about the battle, about the whatever happened on the days or hours of the battle, specific maps of the battle, for instance, and the key moves that happened then. And the center is where you'll have your title and thesis statement front and center. The thesis statement should be short and clear relating to the theme and to the point. And then at the bottom in the main section, you're going to have answers to our five uh, W questions, who, what, when, where, why, along with arguments that go along to support your thesis. On the far side, you'll have things talking about the impact and the results of your argument. The impact will be whatever happened after the historical event and what sort of impact, uh, repercussions it would have on later parts of history. And then at the bottom, you'd follow that up with talking about uh, sort of a conclusion. Why does this matter? How does this relate to the theme? And why do you think this is important? Now, when you're writing your exhibit content, like most of the other pieces that we're going, uh, most of the other presentations that we have, you need to have a process paper of 500 words and an annotated bibliography. Anything on your poster board uh, or any exhibit board needs to be 500 words or less as well. This does include any titles, any captions that you have, any timeline words. So it's kind of going to be, you're kind of going to want to uh, pare down as much as possible on your exhibit board. There can't be really any long giant blocks of text. Those also aren't very fun to read. Now, this does not include any primary or secondary materials that you want to include on your uh, exhibit board. So if you want to include a quote or a citation for a photograph or an image or for the quote itself, that does not count for the 500 words. But again, remember, we're going to want to not clutter things up as much, so no large blocks of text. Like uh, Going off of that, if you're using primary and secondary materials, it's great to do lots of research. It's great to cite them in your bibliography and talk about what you looked at. People love to see that, especially judges. However, you need to make sure that whatever you're putting on your poster board or your exhibit board is absolutely necessary. 
remember, if you think about going to a museum, if you look at the wall in a museum or in an art gallery and see a quotation there, is it a very long amount of text or is it something that sort of encapsulates the whole of the exhibit that fits the theme, uh, a quote or um, a word or description that really narrows down what the entire exhibit is trying to get to as a whole. That's something you should keep in mind when you're creating your own exhibit. Think about some of the cooler places that you've liked to see at museums. If you have the ability to, maybe visit some museums or art galleries to sort of get an idea of ways that you like to see information presented. You can see some examples of uh, winning entries on the National Hin History Day website. There are photographs of uh, some of the winning exhibits from years past. Uh, some of them are very elaborate and impressive. Uh, so when you look at your exhibit, um, you need to remember that the font needs to be large and clear. If you go back to the rubric at the beginning, one of the things they really focus on is that uh, visual effect and clearness and clarity of the uh, of the information on the exhibit is what's important. Make sure all space is used really effectively. You have a very small amount of space and you don't want it to look too cluttered, but on the other hand, you don't want to just have little small pieces based all throughout the board and large empty space. It's going to make judges think, oh, well, you could have used this more effectively to present your argument. Also, when you're th thinking about presentation, think about color scheme. It's great to have lots of color on your exhibit. It really draws the eye to things and makes it look interesting. However, you need to keep in mind sort of the impact of the color, how it's going to be visible to the eye. For instance, if you have a red background and yellow text on top of that, that's gonna be really hard to read and cause some eye strain. So usually what I tend to recommend for exhibit text itself it's just the standard black text, white background. Uh, if you want to add some color, maybe consider putting that on top of a colored cardstock, which is uh, something a lot of people tend to do. Again, you can look at some of the other examples on the websites to check those out. Now, just having text on a background isn't too visually appealing. Some other things that you can add on to your exhibit are timelines, uh, pictures or examples of artifacts that relate to your topic and photographs, paintings, any sort of images that go along with this. Just make sure that they are cited correctly on your board. If you are submitting an exhibit virtually, which is something that we need to think about right now, uh, there is an example of how you would do that on the okhistory.org website. Basically, what we have for a virtual submission is a series of PowerPoint slides where you would place the images of your exhibit. That just makes it a little easier and more streamlined for our judges to see the specific parts of your exhibits. There is also a checklist on the National History Day website if you want to go through that to make sure that you have really covered everything that you need to for your outline. Some do's and don'ts for our exhibit. Uh, definite don'ts do not provide any extra material for judges or anybody else to take with them. Your exhibit should stand on its own. People shouldn't have to carry anything off. Uh, do not provide any links to external sites. There is a tendency for some people to add QR codes to things. However, like we talked about with the websites, we really want to focus on our original content and not link to anyone else's. Don't have any media devices at your exhibit that uh, run for more than two minutes or loop con uh, continuously. Having a media device here and there is, uh, does work, a small video player for instance. However, it can't be something that detracts too much from this text or the uh, information on the exhibit itself. Now, your exhibit must, reply on, must rely on your own analysis and not use too much uh, excessive supplementary material. An exhibit full of just quotations or text from other people isn't really what we're looking for. Your exhibit must fit the approved size requirements. There are size requirements on uh, the National History Day website in the rule book if you want to look at those. Uh, and your quotes and visual sources must be credited on your exhibit and cited on your biography, uh, cited in your um, annotated bibliography, excuse me. All right, uh, that's all we have for the exhibit. I will uh, get back to you for the uh, next part in just a second. All right, 
so now we are going to talk about uh, how to make a successful documentary. So again, we like to start with the rubric, especially looking at the clarity of presentation segment there at the bottom, which really for a documentary focuses on audiovisual and technical content. This is focusing on things more like clearly focused visual audio that is clear to hear. We'll talk about that a lot as we go through this presentation, you'll see. And if you wanna see the rubric that's located on our website or the National History Day website again. When you're making a documentary, what I recommend doing first is kind of watching some historical documentaries on your own. There are lots to find through the Smithsonian, through PBS, through other places that you can sort of take a look around, maybe find a historical documentary of a topic that's of interest to you. There can be some on YouTube, but I would focus more on ones by uh, approved sources, uh, ones that are more focused on history itself. When you choose a topic and write your thesis statement, you're going to want to make sure it relates to the theme while you do your research. Something to remember while you do your documentary is that you need to have access to a computer with video editing software and probably a video camera. You can, use, uh, you can get these uh, supplies through your school, but it's just something to sort of keep in mind how you're going to access this equipment before you go ahead and start planning on your uh, documentary outline as a whole. Then you would create a project timeline, uh, which I will scoot on here in a second, uh, which includes a storyboard. Create a timeline for what you're going to, uh, when you're going to research, when you're going to maybe do any interviews, and how long you think it's going to take to edit the documentary itself. I would allot a little bit more time for editing, especially if you are unfamiliar with the video software. Uh, it can be pretty easy to pick up, and there are plenty of tutorials out there to help you learn editing software. Uh, even want free ones like iMovie or Windows Movie Maker can do the trick, but it's something to remember that when you're putting everything together, there might be a bit of a learning curve. Now, when you're doing a storyboard for a um, documentary, you're always going to want to start with your narration and your thesis statements. You would write out your content first before adding the images that you need. It's a lot easier to find images to fit ideas than trying to uh, fit ideas to images. So uh, it's good to have a full narrative script written out. And what I would do is take a look at this example of a storyboard. It doesn't necessarily have to be like this, but this is kind of a good way to uh, focus it out. A uh, documentary cannot be any longer than 10 minutes. So you see this is broken down by time as well. That's something important to remember when you do your documentary outline. So you start with a title and your thesis statement right off the bat, and then some historical context and background. You would move to the heart of the story. Why is this important? What is uh, really effective about the uh, theme of the documentary that fits your thesis and the theme of History Day. You would then move to the short and long-term impact of the event itself, and then come to a conclusion. At the end, you're also going to need to put an end title credit scene. Here's an example of a more detailed uh, part of a storyboard which you would, uh, where you would match up your images to your actual narration or uh, written content itself. You see that it's broken down in chunks of uh, when you want to narrate something and the image that you'd like to show during that narration. It's a good way to keep all of your images in one place and to sort of match things up along. It's also good that when you're re uh, writing this all out to time yourself reading them out loud so you know how much time you have allotted for each section. The time can go a lot faster than you think. 10 minutes is 600 seconds, and each second takes up, it can take up more, uh, more or less time than you think. Now, like all of our other projects, you need to include a process paper of 500 words and an annotated bibliography. Another thing that is really cool to include in uh, lots of documentaries is an oral history interview. Interviews are a great primary source if you're interviewing somebody who is involved directly with an event. Uh, it makes your documentary feel more personal and more professional, and it can be uh, a great way to just break up what can start seeming like a slideshow of images or video clips and make it more of a uh, real video format. 
Uh, interviewing an expert about a topic who is not involved in the event is a secondary source. What we do not want to do is interview a professional historian about the topic. You might be tempted to do that as they probably have a lot of knowledge in the case, but your job as a researcher is really to take uh, what they have put out about the topic and interpret it for yourself. It's usually recommended for historians not to interview other historians, especially in such a short documentary setting. We want to focus more on people who were there at the event or people who have uh, really important things to say personally about it. Uh, you can also use professional film or photographs or recorded music in a documentary as long as you credit it correctly. However, other people cannot make any media for your project. You must film and edit everything that you put in your documentary. You can find a lot of useful images and documents on the okhistory.org website. Uh, under additional resources, there is a very long list of lots of different places to get images or uh, documents, reading sources, uh, newspaper clippings, uh, things that can you things that you can really pour through to help support your arguments. Now, when you're actually recording the documentary itself, you need to make sure that your narration volume is consistent and well recorded. Audio quality is a big part of the rubric for the documentary. What I would recommend is that you find a quiet place to record your narration and voiceover, that you limit background noise, usually going in a room by yourself, making sure that the, uh, maybe with thicker walls or that any sort of outside sources are quieted for a moment, uh, for a moment. silence your cell phone or any noises on your computers. I've been doing some narrations for videos here and there, and I can't tell you how I've been uh, five, 10 minutes into a full narration doing great, and then my phone goes off, and it's all ruined, and I have to start over. Uh, you can add music to help create flow and sort of build intensity. It really helps uh, add a, a neat touch to your documentary, but I would probably use instrumental music only. There's lots of sources of copyright clean music that you can look up or classical music that can help. However, if you are uh, doing a documentary, let's say about the civil rights movement, and there is a music with lyrics in it specifically that you think would help back up your theme, protest songs, for instance, that have lyrics that you think would go along with it really well, then you can play them. That would be a cool thing to add. Just make sure that through all of this, you balance out the music volume with your audio volume or below it. Uh, this can be something that is a little tricky with video editing software. That's probably the thing that's going to trip you up the most. So spend a lot of time on it. Uh, let other people listen to it and tell you what they think. Uh, outside um, outside uh, information or backup is really helpful in this situation. You can add things like newspaper headlines or other video clips. Uh, maps, uh, visuals of maps are really cool in your documentary, as well as different uh, interview clips. If you have any title screens or screens with quotation and text on them, really anything that is going to involve reading, you need to make sure that you pause the screen long enough for the person to read it. What I would do is pause the screen and then hold it there enough for you to read it out loud at a kind of relatively slow pace. Uh, because if you just have, bam, text pop up and then immediately go away, that's not really going to get the same point across that you need to. Remember to make backup copies of your documentary. Put it on a flash drive, put it on a Google Drive or some other storing software, burn it onto a DVD or CD, put it on several computers if you need to. Also make sure to test your documentary to make sure that it works on several different types of media players. You want to make sure uh, that this is going to be, uh, that people are going to be able to watch this in all circumstances. Now, if you're submitting your documentary virtually, there are different platforms where you can upload your video uh, that can um, work for this situation. There is uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive, for instance. All of them have their pros and cons. Just see what works for you the best. And as long as it's something that everyone can access relatively easily, it's going to be all right. All right. Last thing, do's and don'ts for our documentary. Do not have your documentary exceed 10 minutes. 
do not have anyone other than you operate film, recording, and editing software. This has got to be all you. And uh, don't talk too fast or use excessive transitions in your documentary. It might seem pretty cool to do a neat transition into a different slide or a different image, but doing that constantly really draws away from kind of the beat of your story, the content, your historical research. Your documentary, again, must rely on your own analysis uh, and um, arguments that you want to use to back up your thesis statement. And the last portion of your documentary needs to be a brief list of acknowledgments for the sources that are there. It doesn't have to be a very long list like in your bibliography that you're going to turn in, but it needs to be more something like this. This is a good example of an end title source credit list. You see at the top they have multimedia that they used. It cites where they got images that they used, where they got sound bites or video clips. Uh, you can see that they used clips from Saving Private Ryan, the movie. They put that there. It's again, it's a very kind of brief open uh, way just to say this is what we had at there at the end. It also cites who they did their interviews with. All right, that's all we have for the documentary. We're going to head into our last one, performance, in just a second. All right, here comes the last one. This is tips for how to do a successful National History Day performance. We are going to again start out with the rubric. Take a look there at the bottom uh, for the performance and technical quality of uh, your performance. Uh, there are things that talk about uh, having a polished performance, but also things that talk about emotion and clear speech. These are things that you're going to really want to take a look at when you are working on your checklist for the scenes. There's also something there at the bottom uh, that is about um, a process paper and annotated bibliography, but there's something else for, for a performance that I'll be talking about a little bit later. That's sort of another addition to these things that you turn in that's going to be um, pretty, pretty important. When you create a performance, this is again going to sound very similar, but you're going to choose a topic. Really with a performance, it's less of standing up and saying, this is my thesis statement, than really making it seem this is a theme, this is the heart of the story. You're still going to want to get that across, but without just st stating it straight up and out. This can be a pro and a con. It can be something that some people are really into, uh, something that they think they can convey through uh, emotion and character. Some other people may just want to state what their thesis statement is, say this is my thesis statement and that's all, and that's all right. This is helpful in determining uh, really what uh, form of uh, presentation that you think is going to be right for you. Uh, again, remember historical quality is really what's going to be important here, so you can have the flashiest presentation ever, you can have the best performance, Oscar winning level of acting, but if the historical quality doesn't back it up, then it's not going to be good enough for uh, the judges. Uh, you will then, uh, when you're trying to make your outline, you will prepare a script. It's also good to make a list of any backgrounds, costumes, and props that you think you're going to need to start out with. And you'll probably add or take away from this as you go through your planning process. There are some really great past performances, uh, clips to past performances on the National History Day website that I recommend taking a look at. Uh, when you create a script, what you're going to start with doing is kind of creating an outline for your plot, what information is going to support the themes that you really want to enforce. Remember that with a performance, you want to have an interesting and engaging narrative arc. Uh, when you write a paper, it's more uh, how you want your uh, information to flow well into each other. This is the same way, sort of, but more with an emotional twist, uh, one that's going to hook the audience rather than hook the reader. Consider using an idea map, which we will talk about in just a minute. But another thing to uh, remember to include in your script is stage directions and dialogue, which are going to be really important. You can use actual dialogue and quotations from historical sources uh, to put into your show. This is going to be a pretty, uh, this can be pretty neat, but remember, this isn't going to be just you standing up and reciting a speech that somebody else had written. 
It's good to include quotations from other people to make it seem a little more historically accurate, but at the end of the day, the majority of the content has to be your own. Uh, again, make sure that uh, your script contains references to historical evidence uh, and centers on your thesis statement, but it, when you're talking about your characters, make sure that each of them have their own distinct voice, that, they can, uh, that the audience can distinguish between uh, you, another character in the scene, another character in the scene, that you're all different people with different motivations or ideas or feelings. This can add a little personality to your performance. Also in your script, you need to include descriptions of uh, any background sets or props that you're going to have, uh, write how the characters are going to move around the set, how they interact with any props that are there. Write that in detail because that's going to be the easiest way when you're moving towards actually filming and doing your performance uh, that will help you out. An idea map is very similar to the uh, storyboard that we talked about uh, for our documentary. And like lots of outlines that we've talked about with papers and other historical arguments beforehand. It's a good way to sort of go to the background, move to the build up right before the event, the heart of the story or during the event, sort of things that would happen after the argument that you made, and then maybe the long term impact as well. So unlike a uh, argument moving from point A to point B, point B, this is going to be more of a slow, gradual arc. Um, there is a lot of good um, examples of how to do an uh, interesting performance script on the uh, Minnesota History uh, Historical Society website that um, I really recommend. Props and costumes are a great way to add a sort of personality and uh, convincing uh, themes to your performance. Uh, it makes things seem a little more realistic, but you don't have to spend a ton of money to make a complete historically accurate outfit. You don't have to go full colonial Williamsburg level. You just need to have enough of a costume or prop to get your idea across. For instance, a white button-up shirt, black pants or brown pants or a black or brown skirt, that can work with a lot of different time periods. Consider adding accessories to uh, a planar outfit like this to kind of help things out. Uh, you can use a bandana, a tie, belt, a bag, a shawl, hat, anything along those lines. That's going to be a little easier, probably a little more accessible for us too. You can ask friends or family members if they have anything to help you out. Uh, you can definitely source things from them. You can also have help uh, building any props that you need, any backgrounds that you need, or sewing costumes. However, any of the designs for these props, backgrounds, or costumes need to be your own. You cannot have somebody design a whole costume for you and then sew it for you. That's not going to be your own original content. Also, you don't have to go too wild on backgrounds or props. Just make sure, again, that it's something that can get the point across. Thrift stores or uh, costume rental shops are also good places to look at. If you have access to your school theater department or want to talk to them, ask permission, but they might have some neat things for you to, for you to use as well. Uh, all things considered, a good can of spray paint and some foam board goes a long way. Uh, and as long as you uh, have a little bit of creativity and are open to a little bit of uh, experimentation, uh, you can figure out what you need to do for your performance. When you are actually presenting your performance, when you're acting, you need to make sure that you are turned out towards the audience or camera. Turning out means that at least three quarters of yourself has to be facing the camera. If you are at a side profile angle, it's really hard to read your lips, it's really hard to catch your facial expressions, and to catch your body movements. And these are the things that are really going to take you over sort of the uh, line from just standing doing a monologue to actually acting something out. You need to commit to your character and display emotions and feeling uh, especially on your face, it's called emoting. Uh, when you are performing, it's a, uh, advised to emote a little harder than you would if you were just talking to a regular person, and to talk a little bit louder than you would if you were just talking to a regular person. Uh, this is because when you are kind of projecting it out to an audience, you really want to make sure that these visuals and that those words get across. So you need to push up, uh, hype up a little bit more than what you were doing. 
um, to make sure that that's appropriate. Practice on your own and to a test audience to make sure that they can hear you, that your points are getting across. Practice makes perfect, especially when it's something that you're memorizing like this. Uh, and ask uh, anybody who's watching you for feedback on your performance and take it to heart. Again, like with anything else, you're going to need a process paper and annotated bibliography. We'll talk about our last paper in just a second that we need to add to this. Any virtual submissions that you do, which is probably what we're going to focus on mainly this year, uh, can be filmed on a camera, a phone camera, or recorded through uh, Google Meet, Zoom, or Microsoft Teams. If you are doing a group presentation and you are social distancing, it's all right to uh, do your performance through uh, a conferencing software like Zoom. When you have these virtual options, you can get a little creative with your backgrounds, use digital effects, things like that. Just again, make sure that all of the designs for those are your own. Once you record these pieces, you are going to upload the MP4 file to any of the sharing platforms that we've mentioned beforehand. Make sure again that they're accessible by a large range of people and test out different ways to use them just so you make sure that any judge who gets that piece is able to view it. Also, when you're using your camera, do a few test runs. Make sure the audio quality is clear. Different cameras have different microphone setups. It might be worth it to get a separate backup microphone to use as uh, something that's a little stronger than just a webcam or a phone camera. Uh, audio quality is one of the most important things featured on the rubric, so that's why it's something that we're really going on here. Uh, do's and don'ts for our performance. Don't have it exceed 10 minutes. Don't give any copies of your script to judges. You're not turning in your script in this case. Your script is what you are presenting in your performance. Also, there is no interaction or participate, audience participation. This is just all going to be you and the information that you present. Your performance must be recorded in one take. You cannot edit clips together. Imagine if you were doing a performance in person. You couldn't stop in between. You just have to do one continuous take. It's the same thing virtually. You must operate any media devices yourself. You can include music or audio recordings in your performance, but you have to operate those things by yourself. Also, any camera equipment, that's going to be you. Uh, now, finally, I was talking about that ex extra piece of paper you need to submit with your process paper and bibliography. For the performances, it's called a performance companion worksheet. Uh, you can see the template and an example of a completed worksheet on our website at okhistory.org under the National History Day resources section. Here are some pieces from the performance complete companion worksheet that you would have on there. Essentially, this is a way of talking about what props you used, uh, what backgrounds you used, and what costumes you used, and why you chose them. You can see there's a photo of a prop and a description of it. Small description, doesn't have to go too much into detail. Just say, I chose this prop because of this. It has this purpose in a scene. This is why it's important. Same thing with backgrounds any other costumes you use. It's a great way to sort of plan things out as well, uh, demonstrate that you've thought a lot of this through to the judges. There's also a list of characters that are on the performance companion worksheet, as well as a sort of time frame, when does this take place, uh, and a synopsis of your performance. All right, that's all we have for our performance. I wish you the best of luck in completing your projects this year, and thank you so much for listening. <laughs>